Well, good afternoon officially, everyone. It is now 12 o'clock, so let's get underway. Uh, we have a few housekeeping things to start off with, so uh, that'll give people a few more minutes to be able to join us while we just go top off with a few of those housekeeping duties for today. My name is Lisa Thomas, and I'm the Learning Coordinator for Regional New South Wales, and I'm here to facilitate this session today, which of course is the Riverina Travelling Stock Reserve or TSR Management Pilot. It's a public information session that is being held today. There are a series of them being rolled out. Um, we make some apologies. There were some face-to-face -face information sessions that were previously um, organised, but of course, due to the COVID situation, then had to be cancelled and they're now postponed to a uh, virtual like this. Um, Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional lands on which we meet today. I'm from here in Wiradjuri country, and um, I'd like to pay my respects to Aboriginal elders past, present and emerging. Um, joining me today will be Finn Martin, Manager of Land Services from River and Local Land Services. Um, he's coming to us from Young and he'll be actually presenting today. Plus we have a number of people also on the line, including Emily Steam and the district vet, who'll be here to answer any questions relating to animal health. And also uh, Jonathan Berryman and Peter Beale, who are our team leaders for the TSRs. So just a few things to get started. Um, today we're on a webinar and all attendees are automatically muted and you will not be able to unmute yourselves other than the presenters today. But if you do want to ask any questions and we do welcome your questions, please do that through the control panel at the top on the right hand corner in the questions panel. So you'll need to type your questions in and at the end of the, sorry, the, end of the presentation, I will present those questions to our team of staff here today. Um, if you have any comments on the proposal itself, uh, please make them on the Riverina LLS website. They'll be collated as part of the consult consultation process and I'll be giving you the web address at the end. Um, so please get your comments ready, your uh, questions. There will be a recording that will also be made available on our website. So just about today's session, Riverina Local Land Services is seeking feedback from the public on the proposed management to of the travelling stock reserves in the central and eastern portions of the Riverina region. The initiative proposes to create seven defined grazing regions and Finn Martin will take us through that as well. So um, we've been doing a public consultation until the 7th of June and it's now been extended to Sunday the 30th July. That's this Sunday. So with no further ado, I would now like to hand over to Finn Martin, Manager Land Services, Riverina Local Land Services from Young. Thanks, Lisa. Now, I'm just going to share my screen. Thanks everyone for coming along. Now, I also want to apologise for um, the face-to-face -face meeting cancellation that was, um, I suppose, out of our control to a certain extent with the COVID concerns at the time. We advertised the cancellation on our website and media and social media platforms, but we realised that we did make a, an error in that we didn't get RSVPs from people, um, so we could not um, contact them directly. So. We apologise for any inconvenience. Okay, my presentation now. Okay. Rightio, travelling stock reserves management pilot. The presentation, just going to break it down into three main areas. So that's why we need um, need to change, and, as such, and essentially we just can't operate the way that we are currently um, going with the TSRs. What are the changes and benefits 
for the pilot. And finally, the consultation and questions that um, members of the public and councillors have raised through our um, engagement process. Uh, this last bit, I will concentrate on quite a, quite a bit. We'll go through all the questions that have been raised thus far and um, give you detailed answers. Okay, at a glance, the TSR network in the Riverina. We've got 85,000 hectares of reserves and lineal reserves that you can see on, on the map. In the west, they tend to be lineal reserves that um, stock move along. In the east, you'll see a lot more dots, and these are fenced reserves that are connected by state and local roads. The pilot area we're concentrating in is the, the central area, um, and that is west of the Hume Highway. What are the drivers for change in managing TSRs? We've got um, a decline in condition of a lot of our TSRs, and that's through overgrazing and also weed encroachment. And we've also got um, TSRs are recognised by the rest of the community, by the parts of the community for the biodiversity conservation um, as an asset. Indigenous, indigenous cultural heritage and also recreation. So as we change, um, we've also got less demand for walking stock permits. We've got the tender amounts that we receive um, from our current permitting system of TSRs aren't covering overheads. So this reduced income leads to a whole range of issues in terms of maintenance of TSR infrastructure like water, water points, control of priority weeds, and also compliance issues associated with illegal dumping, firewood removal, and unauthorised acres. It's also important to know that throughout New South Wales, we, the local land services, receive no government funding for over 500,000 hectares of TSRs. It's all reliant um, on the permits. And I suppose seeing that this is unsustainable uh, way to manage, the TSRs at the moment, we're moving towards a more of a user pays model where the shortfall in funding for the TSRs are not funded by ratepayers, but actually funded by um, the people who are using them. So I suppose we look at it um, and Henry Ford made the statement if you always do what you've always done, you always get what you've always got. And we recognise that it's time for change. The pilot is just in the Riverina at the moment, but it's being looked at across New South Wales and all the other LLSs to test the approach. And we have been working with local government um, areas as well. Uh, 10 of those listed there um, to, I suppose, refine the, the um, pilot. So the what now? So this is the detail of the pilot. Essentially, we are doing, um, we're expanding of what we already do. Um, out west with this pilot. But we will see seven grazing areas tended to one permit holder. The permit holder uses the grazing area to move their mob of cattle around via a road network. They'll utilise TSR reserves for overnight or short duration grazing. 
and we'll have a three month rolling grazing plan to detail where the mob will travel. And the mob will be assessed, tracked and audited at regular intervals. So the seven proposed grazing areas uh, can be seen on this map and sorry about the detail. They're not locked in stone at the moment in terms of the, um, the areas and we are looking to more align them with local government areas. But essentially we've come up with this, uh, these seven areas based on um, the amount of grazing available, uh, I suppose history in terms of where stock have uh, walked previously and also what's, um, what's desirable for those permit holders that are looking to tender for a grazing area. So some of the changes that will come in. So with management agreements, and these are these management agreement permits over existing um, fenced reserves. So they are provided on a one to five year basis. We've got 109 of those in the pilot area and essentially they will be um, well, they'll be finalised and not reissued. We also have walking permits. So they are generally for summer autumn months and we can have multiple uh, permits issued to multiple stock owners over those periods and they won't be issued in, in the grazing area areas. What won't change um, are these three other permits. So destination permits. An example of destination permit is where you purchase stock and you actually uh, move them via the road network to your property. Um, also roadside grazing permits. So people access grazing outside their property and they will still be um, permitted and local government are the, um, the people there that uh, offer those. And then we've got routine stock movement permits and that's where a landholder has two properties and regularly moves stock between those two properties. So they'll be maintained. So all those three permits will be maintained and, um, and continue. Okay, so the benefits of the pilot, what we see is the benefits, we're going to be providing strategic grazing through a rolling three month grazing travel plan. And this is for a life of the permit. And we'll be working with local, um, the local councils to, um, to, de well, to develop those plans with the drover. We've also got increased auditing of permit holders and to reduce um, biosecurity risks. So things will be tracking with GPS, tracking collars uh, 24 hours a day in their movements of the, the mob. And we'll have, um, we'll have inspections when they come on to the um, into the grazing area. We also have reduced administrative costs associated with the pilot, going from um, you know 106 people and um, agreements down to seven, and we'll increase our funding base so we can direct more investment into critical areas like pest and weed control infrastructure replacement, fire hazard reduction, and, um, and the like. So just going into the third phase, so I'll just go over what we've done um, to date in terms of consultation. We've written to all the 106 existing permit holders to signal the change with 12 months notice. 
We again did that with two months notice. We undertook a stakeholder analysis to determine market interest in issues. And this was done by a consultant that um, talked to different landholders, drovers and stock and station agents, basically to see if the, the proposal was one, feasible, and two, some of the issues that would be um, that people envisaged. We went to all the local, the 10 local government um, entities to highlight the benefits of the, the pilot in terms of fuel load and weed management. And we gained quite a bit of um, feedback from councils with regard to the pilot. We also went and spoke with um, RFS and the bushfire management committees. and information sessions with New South Wales Farmers, Landcare and the Australian National University. And after all that, we did go back on one-to-one -one type meetings with council to answer some of the questions. Which leads us to a lot of the frequently asked questions that we've been um, posed, that people have posed. And I'd like to go through these individually because they are important and hopefully they'll answer a lot of the questions that you have today. So the first one is who is responsible for the reserve and roadside boundary fences? So we need to look at, um, it's not a, a simple question because we need to look at um, different legislation, but what we do know is landholders are responsible to maintain their boundary fence in a stock-proof condition, and this is based on the Dividing Fences Act. That looks at specifications and who pays for fencing. And indeed, with um, Crown land, when you uh, when your boundary is with Crown land, that falls back onto the landholder. So all road reserves, the landholder is responsible for the fence and the same with TSRs. We also need to look at the Biosecurity Act and that um, is associated with farm biosecurity requirements um, in terms of having stock proof fences. And also another factor is the LS Act and that looks at the actual permit holder, the driver and the permit holder and their need to maintain control of travelling stock and reserves and public roads. So um, a common question that gets raised is the issue of stock getting into adjoining paddocks and causing damage. Um, and I suppose you could draw a comparison to um, a car leaving the road, going through a fence and starting a, a fire in a, in a, you know, a crop. So, Ultimately, it comes back to the permit holder's responsibility um, and liability for their stock. Um, and that's similar to the situation with a car. So it's not the council who manages the, the road. Um, it's actually the person in the, the car that's um, held liable. So, in terms of the driver and, and the permit holder and stock, it's in their best interest for this not to happen because they don't want to be mustering stock in other people's places. So they actually actively go and shut gates um, before the stock pass through and identify any um, uh, fences that are you know, falling down or, or knock stock proof. But Ultimately, if stock do get into a land an adjacent landholder's property, um, they have a $20 million public liability policy that they have to maintain for accidental damage to third party. Um, and I suppose if you look at it with um, routine stock movement permit two, you know, between properties, those people will be going past other neighbours that um, need to have their fences in a stock proof condition also. 
So it's important to recognise in this space as well that um, it doesn't normally happen. Sorry, I'll just uh, stop that. This doesn't happen um, often at all. And after talking to the rangers and people who have worked in the TSR space previously, um, they don't actually know of any um, legal case associated with this. And the only one that they did come up with was um, where a bull escaped a reserve and hit a car. And then the police investigation resulted in the um, permit holder being liable. Okay, so that's the fence one. Just go on to the next. Okay, what about the spread of weeds by travelling stock? So we've got the three, three month travel plan and um, in this we'll be working with weeds officers to identify problem areas to avoid during, say, example, seed set. Uh, St John's Ward would be a classic example here. So we would actually identify those spots and avoid stock moving through those areas during those periods. Um, the other aspect of the pilot is that LLS would um, take over all control of weeds on TSRs and then coordinate with council weed control staff on roads as well. So it won't be up to the permit holder to control weeds. It will come fall back onto LLS. And it's been um, recognised that you know, through grazing, you can have a suppression of weeds through um, grazing. And indeed, you can get better access to control weeds during that um, process as well. So if you can see the weed, you can control it. Okay. Uh, next question, is this increasing the risk of biosecurity outbreaks? So, we believe the pilot will put us in a better place to manage animal health and biosecurity risk. And we've got Emily Stearman who can answer questions after this too, who's um, a district vet. But essentially what we're doing in this space is checking the mob when the permit is granted and new cattle are brought in, uh, maintaining the national livestock identification uh, system and animal health statutory declaration records. We will be tracking the mob with um, the satellite tracking collars and we'll be performing regular audits and there'll be regular monitoring by ranges of, of the TSRs and things like um, ground cover levels. Uh, the next question, who have you consulted with this, um, about this pilot? And this is just a, a cut and paste from previously. So we, we have um, consulted a, a range of stakeholders. We haven't, and we'll put our hand up, we haven't consulted everyone. And I suppose um, the, the questions that we're getting back are fairly common um, amongst people. So we've gone to all our stakeholders to identify the main questions. And, um, but uh, through this process, if there's anything that's not explained, please feel free to um, go through the web page and pose the question. How will you monitor this program? So the Ground cover aspect will be a focus of monitoring um, along with animal health and weeds, but essentially we don't want um, TSRs and roads overgrazed and this actual pilot will help that. We don't see that in, in the West as much with travelling stock because they're moving all the time. We do see it in the East with um, some reserves where stock are either set stock or overstocked for a long period of time. 
We're also working with the Australian National University to develop a long-term monitoring program to measure condition change of TSRs. And we'll be working with drovers to collate information about the TSRs and road suitability. Things like um, the water, fencing, yard infrastructure, animal health issues and weed distribution. So another question, can I still get a roadside grazing permit? Simple answer is yes. And another question, isn't this just a money grab from LLS? So we'd say no, but it is a way to cover costs associated with running the 85,000 hectares of TSRs that we've got across the Riverina. Um, we, are, we don't have a lot of staff working in this area and we're trying to avoid the situation where ratepayers cover the shortfall, other ratepayers. So will I be informed when travelling stock come past my property? So no, you won't be informed directly, but drovers do go ahead of the mob to ensure gates are shut and fences are in, are in a stock proof condition. Um, and the next question is how many stock will be in the herd or a mob? So we've had eight to 900 um, head in mobs that moved through these areas previously. We do have a, a limit of a thousand if conditions allow, but we need to take into consideration the reserve width and the feed availability availability and we'll be working with the permit holder with the three month grazing plan to adjust that. So that's the end of the questions but I'll just go into a, a summary. So it's important to know that we actually operate in this way in the west all the time and in the east during dry times with walking permits. So in the summer months we don't see a lot of issues around travelling stock in the past in these areas. We want to improve the condition of the reserves and roadsides through the grazing, um, through basically grazing followed by long rest periods. We want to minimise biosecurity risks associated with travelling stock. It's important um, to still recognise that was, we'll still have um, the three um, permits available being the destination permits, roadside grazing and routine stock movement permits and also the APRIS will still be allowed on the stock reserves. And we're aiming to reduce subsidisation by other ratepayers. People aren't um, necessarily actively using the, the TSRs. And we see a, a real benefit out of greater collaboration with local government, especially the, the, the weeds officers through this pilot. Okay, that brings us to the end. Um, I have listed three numbers there, jo Jonathan Berriman, Peter Beale and myself. So you can contact us if you've got any specific questions or um, you've also got the opportunity to put them in the chat or on the, um, on the web, through the web page. Thanks, Ben. So we do have a couple of questions for you. So if I can just invite our panel to uh, come back onto the line, please. So. Uh, Emily Stearman, the district vet, if we have any animal health questions. Also, also Peter Beal and Jonathan Berryman, who are part of the TSR management team. Uh, so the first question comes from Gemma Pritchard, and she asks, is Tumbarumba or Maragall covered in the pilot? Jonathan? Um. Yes, I can, I can answer that. No, we're not looking to cover um, up in the high country there um, within this pilot. So 
majority of it is uh, uh, west of the Hume Highway. Um, a lot of the reason for that is um, that there are a lot smaller reserves and the road systems up there are a lot smaller, so uh, we haven't included uh, them within this pilot. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, Gemma asked another question as well. Will permit holders be able to put locks on LLS gates when they have stock in? There you go. Uh, we can't hear you, Peter. No, I'll, I'll answer that if you like. Um, so, um, no, we, we, we're looking that the permit um, holders won't be looking to put locks on them. Uh, these uh, traveling stock reserves are still open to the public. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, for recreational uses, so um, uh, it, we would only put this on there if there were uh, an issue with the legal, you know, firewood collection or whatever that we determined that um, uh, you know we have, to have a, more of a focus of stopping people going in for those illegal activities. So in general, no, we lots on them. Great, thank you. A question from Mick Ticehurst. Who pays for the collars? We do. Local land services does? Land services have, a, um, yeah, have the collars and we provide them to the, the permit holder to attach. And typically on a 800 would have um, three collars. And Nick has another question. How can a roadside permit be issued over TSR that has a map over it or MAP over it? So, yeah, JB. Yeah, so, um, so there won't be general management agreement permits over our reserves. Um, it will just be this one grade uh, permit for the reserves. We can issue roadside grazing permits um, uh, along those roads outside of the uh, the landholders' property. Um, however, as always, there's no difference. The uh, the walking stock do have priority over those, and so once the walking stock has gone through, then uh, the available feed after that, then roadside grazing permits can be issued. Okay, thanks, Jonathan. I might just get you to come a little bit closer to the monitor. I think we're getting some feedback, which is probably coming from Peter's um, computer. Uh, one from Andrew Sheridan. Will the permit holder be able to tender as a combined timber, for example, two or three people? Um, so we would only be dealing with one entity. Um, so they, the, the different, if they wanted to combine together, uh, they, they can do that, uh, but they would have to come in to us as a one identity that we work with, not with several of them, but they can have a couple of them with uh, uh, farmers to get that. They would have to set up a, a, a business um, enterprise uh, with all of them involved. Okay. Peter, can I just get you to uh, put yourself on mute or I can put you on mute? Because there's quite a bit of feedback coming through. Yeah. Okay, so you're on mute now, Peter. Uh, Carla Bryant asks, as increased funding base was mentioned as a benefit, how do we know how do we know this before tenders have been received? So um, I'll answer that. So we went through the analysis, the economic analysis with the consultant, and we basically assessed what we would need um, for to break even. So we worked out the costs, um, overheads, and everything with the the TSRs. And I suppose the whole point of this pilot is to see if we can't generate more income than we are currently are with the, the um, management agreement permit system. So at the moment, we do 106 um, 
people tender for 106 reserves individually. It's um, quite labour intensive and um, onerous to do up all those management agreements. Um, what we're looking at now is just having seven um, areas to tender for. So uh, the the economic analysis basically indicated that, and people were interested. Um, so one, we've got interest in the proposal, and two, we feel that the, um, the rates, which will be well below normal lease rates for for um, properties, but even at that lower rate, would still cover the um, overheads. So I suppose just in summary, the overheads were so high that the estimates of, you know, what the normal traffic would be or the expecting traffic would have a, a benefit financially going down this track. Yes. Okay. So that's all the questions that we have so far. Um, I'll just ask Emily Stearman if you'd like to make any comments. Um, seeing we haven't had any questions for you today, Emily. A nice specific comments from me. Thanks, Lisa. Um, yeah, if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to assist where I can. Great. Okay. So if there are, oh, here we go. Sorry, I do have another question. Uh, just can't quite see who this is from, but I'll ask it anyway. Um, you mentioned that no landowner would have any forward warning of stock passing their adjoining land. How is this managed during very busy farming activity periods, such as grain harvesting activities? That question comes from Ralph Gebert. So, do you need the question again? No, that's fine. JB, did you put your hand up? Yeah, look, um, there's no real changes of what we already do at the moment. Uh, we already have walk-in stock going around the road systems. Um, so, we don't give free warning of those um, now. We, we, we're not looking to do that uh, through this pilot. So, so nothing really changes from what we were originally doing anyway. Um, as, as we progress, it would be nice to think that uh, the travel plans eventually, we might be able to get up on our website, so the three months travel plans that uh, Pim was, was, was talking about, once they're finalised, then um, we could put them on, but they're not. Uh, being a three months travel plan, it wouldn't be so accurate as exactly where they're going down and what road within that three months, but it would give landholders a, a, a general idea um, of, of where the mobs are. Fantastic. Uh, question from Ingrid Slattery. Will stock be required to be vaccinated, for example, pestivirus? Emily? Oh, happy to cover up on that one. Um, no, there'll be no requirements for specific vaccinations. And Robert McGeoch asks, who is responsible for feral animal control like foxes and rabbits? So biosecurity risks such as pests and weeds, the local land services will be responsible for that in these areas. And Andrew Sheridan asks, what is the term of the tender period? So it's one to five years. We're, we're looking to bring it into line with existing management agreements, which would have made it a four year term from July. We haven't actually implemented um, and gone out for tender yet. So it's been delayed, but it will be the residual and we hope to bring it in alignment with other management agreements. So it'll be somewhere between uh, three and four years. 
And I think you may have covered this, but uh, we'll go through it anyway. Who is going to restore rural road damage with respect to signage, culverts and mitre drain restoration? Uh, answer that. Um, I suppose you look at historically uh, travelling stop going down the roads, which we're doing all, you know, all the time. Um, we haven't had any uh, real complaints in regards to that. We see no difference to be what we're doing in the past. Um, so when we spoke to our, our, our rangers, um, they don't the stock are pretty docile on the on the road system. They're used to those. Uh, they're not like paddock stock um, going along the road. So we haven't really had any complaints from local governments in regards to traveling stock on the roads and damage that they've done. So we don't look that that would be uh, any different. We're certainly working with local uh, governments um, in regards to their maintenance programs, as example, uh, gravel roads, for instance. We might look to uh, put uh, stock down gravel roads prior to uh, the grading rather than afterwards, keep them away from uh, wet weather, um, put them in areas which are, are, are drier rather than put them over there which are waterlogged. So working with local governments um, is, a, is a key point uh, with that, but really no different to what we've done in the past. And Mick Tice has asked, is there going to be a minimum dollar amount on each map? So yes, the, the quick answer is is yes. Um, you know, we obviously need to make more money than we're currently making. So it's not a map as as um, though management um, agreement. It will be uh, basically a, a permit, walking permit for that grazing area. And Bronwyn Burns asked, so what protection is there for adjoining landholders and ratepayers in terms of animal health? The risks essentially are the same as they have been with previous management of the TSRs. Okay, and Clara Bryant asks, what is the projected start date for the pilot program? Uh, well, Sorry, we're yeah. anticipating now, uh, by the time we've gone through this process, uh, finalise the prospectus to go out. Um, I would say we're looking towards the uh, beginning of the new calendar year, I would say by the time we've We've done everything so uh, to be able to start from them, uh, but the prospectus has to be out for them. Uh, I believe this is another question from Andrew Sheridan. With the current seasonal conditions, it appears that there is very little to no demand on the TSR road grazing at the moment. If no tenders are received, what will the contingency plan be? I'd probably answer that. I, I suppose we'll go back to the drawing board and have a look and see what um, uh, what the reasons are that we we, we haven't got um, tenders in. We might look at those areas to see uh, what those reasons are. are. Are they too big an area? Uh, do they need to reduce in size? Do they need to be bigger areas? So collect that information in regards to why that is um, and then go forward from there. And here we go with another one. Can't quite see who this is from. It may be from uh, Ralph again. Is there sufficient evening containment areas for these stock? In the past, meaning drought times, livestock were contained in short laneways, which resulted in significant damage when the stock departed. So, Rel was asking if there is going to be sufficient evening containment areas for the stock. I can probably answer that one um, as well. Um, yes, those stock do need to be contained. Um, 
will they go into some of those laneways as they have done in the past? Yes, potentially they can, but there is a responsibility on that um, on those drivers to ensure that they don't damage those fences. Um, so what they'll do is they'll put an electric fence um, around those stock um, to contain them uh, while they're there in the, 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 those areas. Okay, I think that that is the end of our questions for today. So I just want to remind everyone that there are fact sheets and other frequently asked questions are on our website. And you can see that we have the have your say at lls.nsw.gov.au slash riverina. So go to our website, you should be able to Google it and have your say on the consultations. Thank you very much for joining us today. If you do have additional questions or a comment, please go to our website or of course we have the phone numbers and email addresses on the screen of our presenters today, Peter Bill, Jonathan Berryman and Finn Martin. And I'd like to thank you all today, the presenters, for uh, giving us this great overview and please pass any details along. Our next webinar will be on Wednesday at 12 o'clock and uh, if anyone has had any concerns, please contact us. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day.